This is a tough topic to address, especially in a 25-minute window. Uh, so one of the courses I teach at Tyndale is on the problem of evil. So it's 36 hours on the problem of evil, and here I've got 25 minutes. So what I thought I would do to sort of narrow things down a bit is pick something that's more directly in line with the conference theme. Has God spoken? Um, there's a whole variety of problems of evils uh, that people could, array, uh, could raise. What we see, though, is uh, Bart Ehrman, in his book, God's problem, uh, he raises what I'm, I'm kind of referring to as a biblical problem of evil. So you might not be able to see the subtitle there, so I'll read it to you. It's the title's God's problem, how the Bible fails to answer our most important question, why we suffer. So is that, is that true? Is it the case that God has not tell, told us very much about why we suffer, that the Bible fails to answer that question. So the pervasiveness of evil and suffering, um, unfortunately, we all probably have experienced quite a bit on our own. Um, and it causes different kinds of problems. Um, it might cause a problem for current believers who might now begin to wonder, does God really love me? Or, you know, I've been trying, I've been, I've been uh, seeking after God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, uh, and yet these terrible things are still happening. How could that happen? How could God let something so bad happen to me or to, to someone that, so bad, something so bad happen to someone that I love? Um, so it can cause a problem for believers, but also for non-believers. Um, it can cause problems for non-believers many times, uh, you know, so whenever you're off in grad school in philosophy and you're talking with non-believers uh, and you ask them, you know, why aren't you a Christian? A lot of times they'll say something like, well, uh, all of the evil in the world. So evil counts as a knock against belief in God's existence. And that's what we'll see is what is uh, uh, Bart Ehrman's objection. Uh, so in the, in the introduction to the first chapter of his book, he gives a really fascinating story about how he was a pastor, he was you know, kind of tr really trying to sell his uh, true believing bona fides. He's going through all of the things he did, all of the schools he went to, Moody and all of these other places. And then it was through teaching a course on the problem of evil that he began to reject his belief in God. So it's, it's the, it was a major problem for uh, Bart Ehrman. Uh, my fancy iPhone remote isn't going to work, so I'll just do it this way. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is whether or not it's the case that has God said anything about the problem of evil? Uh, that's one. Uh, so Ehrman thinks he, Ehrman would agree that he has. Um, it just... Unfortunately, to the second point, what God has said about the problem of evil isn't very helpful. Um, so God has spoken about evil, but it doesn't help us out very much. That's what we're going to address today. So now before we do that, it'll be helpful, I think, to talk a little bit about the problem of evil itself. So yes, yeah, so here's a representative quote from Ehrman. He says, I realized I could no longer reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of life. In particular, I could no longer explain how there can be a good and all-powerful God actively involved in the world given the state of things. Given this state of things, he couldn't reconcile how God could be alive and active in this world. Now, what are, what are these this state of things? Well, it's the presence of evil. One of the things that Ehrman does well in this book is he gives a, a running catalog of really terrible things that have happened. And it's something we shouldn't gloss over or forget. But he says, look, all of these terrible things that are going on in the world, I can't make sense of how God could be alive and active in that. Now, um, there's, there's a lot wrong with Ehrman's book. And so the other advantage of choosing him is it was easier to do a, this talk in 25 minutes because there's not a whole lot worth discussing in the book because a lot of it is misguided. Uh, but the, he does a couple of things right. So in addition to helping us remember all of the bad things that are going on in the world and not forget them, uh, to have that in the forefront of our minds so we can pray for those who are suffering, uh, we can do, what we, take our, do our part to try and alleviate that sort of suffering, that's good. The other thing that's good about his book is he does a pretty good job of going through and outlining, sort of cataloging, all of the different responses to evil that you can find in Scripture. And so what I thought we would do today is look at the three primary examples that he looks at. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, get to that in just a minute. Um, first, we need to talk about Ehrman's problem of evil. Aha. This is page one, and this is page three. 
That's why things weren't making sense. Sorry, hang on. And there is no page two. Okay, so uh, here's Ehrman's problem of evil. God is all powerful, God is all loving, and there is suffering. So he says this right in the book, uh, his book, God's Problem, on page eight. Um, God is all powerful, God is all loving, and there is suffering. This is the crux of Ehrman's problem of evil. Why he thinks it's so difficult to understand how you can make sense of God's existence given all of this evil. Now, if you look at these three ideas, though, God is powerful, he's all loving, and there is suffering, that alone doesn't get you to a real actual problem. Like many of us, fully committed believers of Christ, uh, say, yes, God is all powerful, yes, God is all loving, and yes, we recognize that there is suffering. So what's the problem supposed to be? Well, he helps us. He, he connects a few dots here for us. He says, if God is all powerful, then he's able to do whatever he wants, and therefore he can remove suffering. If he is all loving, then he obviously wants what is best for his people and therefore doesn't want them to suffer, and yet people suffer. How can that be explained? That's the problem for Ehrman. How these ideas in his own mind are connected. If God's all powerful, he could prevent it. Uh, if he's all loving, he would want to, yet people continue to suffer. That's Ehrman's biblical problem, or Ehrman, Ehrman's problem. Now, it's worth noting something. Um, this problem that we just rehearsed was first uh, formulated in a much more rigorous way by this guy, a fellow by the name of J.L. Mackey, in his book, uh, or in an article that came out in 1955 called God and Omnipotence, where he outlines in a very rigorous way this exact problem. It's known as the logical problem of evil. What's interesting is Mackey, in 55, presents this argument. Then, much later, in 1982, he says of his own argument, uh, since this defense, here he's, he's referring to what's known as the free will defense that we'll get to near the very end that you can actually see elements of in scripture. Mackey says, since this defense is formally possible and its principle involves no real abandonment of our ordinary view of the opposition between good and evil, we can concede that the problem of evil does not, after all, show that the central doctrines of theism are logically inconsistent with one another. So the main proponent of this ar argument that Ehrman raises in this book that came out in 2008, this, this, that argument is basically the same as Mackey raised in 55, but in 1982, he admits that problem fails, that the logical problem of evil fails. So Ehrman is advancing an argument, a, st a problem of evil, that even the most ardent defender of that problem admits doesn't work. Now, why would he do that? Is it just to sell books? Well, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but I think there's another reason that he might do that. The problem for Ehrman is that he doesn't think that evil, uh, he doesn't think that this free will defense as a response to evil, that the evils that we see in this world, what he says in his book is he says, look, that is actually only, plays a minor part in, 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 in scripture. So whenever you look through all of the Bible, you only see people explaining evil based on free will just every once in a while. So Ehrman's problem with this free will defense, even though even Mac, J.L. Mackey himself says it works, it, it solves the problem, uh, Ehrman doesn't like it because he doesn't think it's biblical enough, which is interesting. Um, so what he wants to say is, look, the, the, the reasons that the Bible gives us for there being evil are different. But they're not just different, they're different and they're not satisfying enough. So he gives us, uh, he, there's, there's a, a few others, but the three main ones are, he looks at the, the biblical reasons for evil in terms of uh, suffering ha serving a redemptive purpose, suffering as, as a redemptive in nature. A second one that he looks at is suffering as punishment for sin. Suffering is somebody's done something wrong and they're suffering uh, because of that. Um, the third is that suffering is a consequence of sin. So sometimes we suffer because of what somebody else is doing. Somebody else has sinned. That third one is where you'll see the connection with the free will defense that we'll get to uh, in a minute. So he considers these various scriptural accounts for evil. Right? So has God spoken about it? Yes. But unfortunately, what he said about it isn't very helpful. He says, 
In this book, I've looked at a range of the biblical answers, and most of them, in my opinion, are simply not satisfying intellectually or morally. So yes, God has spoken, but the answers, what he said about evil, isn't satisfying morally or intellectually. So what we're going to do is go through and look at what is the problem with, the biblical, with these three biblical responses to evil. We'll see where, why Ehrman thinks these are not satisfying intellectually or morally. Okay, so let's start with redemptive suffering. Um, it might take up my time if I was to read 14 chapters out of Genesis to you. Uh, so I'll just give you the citation. Um, Genesis 37 to 50, we get in that uh, the story of Joseph. Um, and this is, this is uh, Ehrman's uh, passage that he cites. Says, so Joseph suffers a lot, right? He's sold into slavery. He's mistreated. Um, but there was a redemptive purpose, right? We see at the very end, right? There was a reason for that. Where his brothers come to him for help. And he ends up saving the patriarch uh, as a result of that. So there's a redemptive purpose. We see this, uh, and it, this is another passage uh, that Ehrman cites in John, John 11, uh, with uh, Lazarus. Uh, so John 11, uh, verses 4, Jesus says this. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So Lazarus was sick for a reason. There was something, there was, there was a redeeming purpose to that, namely that God's glory would be revealed. Okay, well, how many of you think that makes sense? Anybody say, no, that's not any good? No. Well, what's the problem with the scripture account saying that, redempt, uh, that suffering has a redemptive purpose. Well, Ehrman tells us. He says, I'm opposed to the idea that we can universalize this observation by saying that something good always comes out of suffering. That's it. That's the argument. The problem for Ehrman is you can't universalize this. Okay, who said that this was the only reason for suffering? I know of zero Christian philosophers or theologians. I know of zero passages in scripture where it suggests that all suffering is for redemptive purposes. So I'm not sure how far to take this objection. He seems to be saying, look, um, because we can't universalize it, it's not a good response. What he's not considering is that maybe it's the case that some suffering is redemptive. And so for those instances of suffering, the Bible does have something meaningful to say about why we suffer. It does answer our most important question for those kinds of suffering. Sometimes suffering might be for other reasons, but sometimes it might be for redemptive reasons and scripture uh, addresses that. I, know zero of any, I don't know of anyone who says that this is a universal principle. So I don't think this is a good reason to think that what the Bible has said is not helpful for us in thinking about redemption, or about suffering. Um, okay, so what about the next instance? Suffering as a punishment for sin. Um, so we, here's another passage. Uh, Amos 2, uh, 1 to 3 and 6. Um, so I'll just read this. Uh, it says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not revoke the punishment. I, what kind of punishment? I will send a fire upon Moab, and Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst and will kill all its princes with him. It's pretty severe, right? It's clear someone, Moab, suffering as a result of sin. But... In verse 6, we see it's not just, those, uh, it's not just uh, those people who are not part of God's people. It's not those apart that, that this is true of. This is, this is also true for God's people. So verse 6 says, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. And then they get an even longer explanation of what that punishment looks like. So whether you're a member of God's people or not, clearly you suffer as a result of sin. This, you see, whenever you read through, I remember whenever I was young and uh, a young Christian and naive, and I kept getting frustrated whenever I'd read the sort of cyclical nature. So, so look, uh, all these terrible things happen, uh, and then because of their sin, and so then they repent, and things are better, and then they start sinning again, and I'm thinking, come on, get with the program. Don't you realize what happens? And then at some point, sort of some uh, higher level consciousness emerged, and I realized, oh, that's your own life too, you dummy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, 
it, 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 it is clear, through, we see in lots of cases in Scripture, that there is a good amount of suffering that is simply a direct result of God's punishing people. Um, Ehrman goes a bit further and says, uh, he says, look, the logic is clear. Suffering comes from God as a result of punishment, and if you return to him, the suffering will end. Now, again, this, I think we see lots of biblical examples of this. So what's, what's the problem? Well... Surely there must be other explanations for the pain and misery in the world. And as it turns out, there are other explanations even within the Bible itself. Well, this is interesting. Ehrman, the, the italicized portion there is from me, uh, basically refutes his own argument as to why su seeing suffering as a punishment for sin is a problem. What's the problem for thinking that some suffering is a cause of God's punishment, or is a result of God's punishment? Well, you can't universalize it. It doesn't apply to all. Now, I mean, if you just read the book of Job, you would recognize not all suffering is a, is a consequence of God's punishment. That kind of seems to be one of the points of the book of Job. Um, so we'd say, but that's not a universal principle. But even Ehrman admits it's not a universal principle. He says, look, there are other accounts in the Bible. What are these other explanations, evil within the Bible itself? I don't know. Maybe sometimes suffering is serving a redemptive purpose, like what we just saw. So I mean, you, you just take a lot of time to tease out the problems with this New York Times best-selling author uh, book uh, of what is a problem with his, his rejection of the Bible's solution or responses to suffering. Of course, there are other explanations. Uh, for, there are other reasons for Bible uh, for, for suffering. Of course, we can't universalize that principle. If you look in John nine with the man born blind, right? What do the disciples say? Whose sin is it? His or his parents? Jesus says, neither. It's so God's glory can be, be, be revealed, right? The, the power of God can be shown to be true in this. It, it, of course there are other explanations. So we have two accounts or two ways that the Bible attempts to answer our most important question. Uh, re redemptive uh, purposes, and sometimes it's a consequence of sin. We're not saying in either case that that covers all types of evil, but it covers some and so it looks like, at least so far, we don't have overwhelming reasons to think that the Bible fails to answer our most important question. Okay, let's look at one more. Suffering as a consequence of sin. Suffering as a consequence of sin. So here's a passage for you, Jeremiah 5, 26 to 29. I'll just read to you. Um, for wicked men are found among my people. They lurk like uh, fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men like a cage full of birds. Their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with the justice that the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. That's right, really terrible people here. Uh, but guess what? Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? So in this passage, we actually see, in one passage, two different reasons for evil. The first is one that we already saw. These people are about to suffer as a consequence of their own sin. He says, shall I not punish them for these things? They're about to get some suffering because of their own sin. But why are they about to suffer because of their own sin? Well, because the, of the way they were sinning against others. They were the ones that were being deceitful. They were the ones that were hurting others. In their, and how, so there were other people who were suffering as a result of their sin. Um, we see the same thing when David orchestrates the death of Uriah. Right? Um, someone else suffered. It, it, it wasn't his sin that caused his, his own death. It was David. David was the one that orchestrated it, right? Um, Paul is repeatedly in the midst of suffering, getting beaten all the time, right? Not because of his sin, but because of the sin of others. So, suffering as a consequence of sin, you might say, is suffering as a response or as a consequence of other people misusing the freedom that God gave them. That God has given us free will, and unfortunately, we tend to use it improperly a lot and cause a lot of pain and suffering in the, in the, as in, in, the, in the process. So what's the problem with this sort of an account? Why does Ehrman not like the argument that suffering is a, co is a consequence of other people's sin, or that it's a result of people misusing their free will? Well, he says, of people who have expounded these kinds of arguments, 
Um, he says, I don't know if you've read any of the writings of the modern theodicists. So someone who's engaged in theodicy is someone who's simply trying to give an explanation for the, 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 how God and evil could sort of exist at the same, at the same time. Um, he says, I don't know if you've read any of the writings of the modern theodicists, but there's something to behold. They're precise, philosophically nuanced, deeply thought out, filled with esoteric terminology, and finely reasoned explanations for why suffering does not preclude the existence of a divine being of power and love. Well, case closed. I should give up, right? I mean, yes, I agree, Ehrman. They are precise, philosophically nuanced, deeply thought out. They do give, provide finely reasoned explanations for why suffering doesn't preclude the existence of divine of a being of uh, power and love. So what's the problem? What's the objection? Well, uh, did I get cut off? It did. Uh, so I'll, the, he goes on. Sorry. The very next line he says, um, frankly, to most of us, these writings are not just obtuse. They're disconnected from real life. Life as lived in the trenches. So the worry for Ehrman is these kinds of responses that, so um, uh, there's a, a philosopher by the name of Alvin Plantinga, a Christian philosopher, many of you have probably heard of him. He, he's the one that sort of forced J.L. Mackey to admit that the logical problem of evil fails. Uh, in, in, in this book, that's who Mackey is referring to as Plantinga's response. So the, uh, the worry is that whenever you have people like Plantinga and lots of other really good Christian philosophers and theologians who have given a, an account of how evil exists because of mis, our misuse of free will, that that explains the presence of a good amount of evil, that they're, they're, they're um, too philosophically oriented. They're, they're disconnected from life as lived in the trenches. Now what's happened here is Ehrman has subtly moved the goalposts. He's the one that raised, right, so one of the first slides that we saw, he's the one that raises this intellectual problem. And he says, look, if God is powerful and loving, how can there be evil? Right? He's raised an intellectual objection to God's existence based upon evil. But then whenever somebody gives an intellectual response, he says, oh, well, that's disconnected from life in the trenches. That's too abstract. But guess what? Even the most ardent proponent of the free will defense, Alvin Plantinga, even he says, look, this isn't designed to respond to those in the trenches. So this is from his book, God, Freedom, and Evil. He says, uh, this is Alvin Plantinga, faced with great personal suffering or misfortune, one may be tempted to rebel against God, to shake his fist in God's face, or even to give up belief in God altogether. But this is a problem of a different dimension. Such a problem calls not for philosophical enlightenment, but for pastoral care. So even Alvin Plantinga himself, the best free will defender, says, look, the free will defense does solve this intellectual problem, the problem that, that Mackey raised and then eventually gave up on, that Ehrman is still raising, says, but it's not supposed to connect to life lived in the trenches. That gets a different sort of a response because it's a different sort of a problem. Ehrman is conflating a philosophical problem with a pastoral one. He raises the philosophical problem and then whenever he gets the answer to it, wants a pastoral response. Now, um, what's really fascinating is that Ehrman himself actually admits that evil, that the free will response, that, that evil exists because there is a, a, a misuse of free will, he actually agrees and admits that that's the cause. The, the misuse of free will is the cause of evil. And so he says, this is the last quote from, uh, from Ehrman, he says, look, the pain done to human beings by human beings is not caused by a superhuman entity. So yeah, that's, we're, we're okay with that. Um, since human beings misbehave and hurt others out of their free will, we need to intervene ourselves and do what we can to stop the oppression, torture, and murder. And so do what we can to help those who are subject to these abuses of human freedom. Well, that's exactly the primary account that we've been giving. Like when you read through scripture, most accounts of evil are because of people misusing their free will. They're either sinning themselves and getting punished because of their misuse of their free will, or other people are being hurt because of somebody else's misuse of free will. But even Ehrman admits that that's a good explanation for why there is evil in the world. 
So we have no reason, I don't think, from Ehrman to think that God has not spoken about why there is suffering in the world. And we have no reason to think that what he has, not, that what he has said is not helpful. So contrary to Ehrman, uh, the Bible does answer our most important question, why we suffer. It does not fail in that regard. And I think I'm out of time as well. So thank you.